back to chapter 1, and, um, and we're just going to kind of take a journey. You're going to kind of take a journey with me, um, because um, boys, you're going to try to, you're going to take a journey with me, and we're going to take a, a journey with Habakkuk, and he, um, he was a guy that was similar to what a lot of us are facing right now. See, tonight I'm going to leave you with four responses as we take a journey in, in Habakkuk. Four responses that is to be our response to this horrific events that happened on Sunday, October 1st at 10 o'clock p.m. See, I, honestly, if I can be honest with you uh, tonight, which I feel like we can be real with each other. Um, honestly, Sunday night, October 1st, started out to be a great night. Um, Many of you may know him from summer camp, um, but a good friend of mine, uh, Pastor Daniel Klein um, from Trinity Life Center, um, he he got married Sunday night, and so I was I was at his wedding, and it was it was a beautiful wedding, and it was it was it was awesome. I got to um, I got to witness one of my closest friends um, getting married, and by the end of the night, it became a nightmare because. I heard about all the victims that were hurting. And, and for some reason, their hurt became something that I started to hurt. And I think that's what happens when we are connected with Jesus, when we, when we choose to love Jesus, when we choose to follow Jesus. What, what hurts the heart of Jesus hurts the heart of us, hurts the heart of me. And I started to hurt. What started to be a great night for a lot of us, including me, started to be a night of, of hurt. And Habakkuk was facing the same thing. See, um, there was these people called the Babylonians, and, and they captured uh, Egypt's land. They captured the Assyrian land. And they weren't really nice people. They were people that was, that was full of injustice, that, that acted out. Um, in injustice acts. They were people that acted out in violence. And, and Habakkuk was confused like a lot of us are right now. And we're just, like I said, we're just going to take a journey and, and, and see the four responses that Habakkuk made that really we should make. And it starts in verse 2 of chapter 1. And, and we're going to go all through the first three chapters and And um, I'm going to read some verses. I'm going to tell you some stories about it. And so this is what it says. This is what Habakkuk says to the Lord. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. But I forever see these evil deeds. Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Habakkuk had a real moment with God, right? Like, Habakkuk was like, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand that. I don't understand this. And I don't understand why everywhere I look, there's violence. And check out what he says. He says, God, why aren't you listening? God, why aren't you doing nothing? Why haven't you done anything? Why is it that I feel like you are silent and absolutely doing nothing right now? I'm like, wow, that's pretty gutsy for Habakkuk to to do. And he opens us up with the first response that we are to make in the midst of ridiculous hate. The first response is this. Ask God the tough questions. Ask God the tough questions. What, What I learned from Habakkuk's story is that it's okay to ask God questions. It's okay to question God. It's okay to vent to God. It's okay to be frustrated about the evil that's going around and venting that to God. It's okay to ask him questions. Honestly, I think questions are really important because without questions, we don't get answers. 
right? And, and all throughout the Bible, we, we see people asking God questions. And in the midst of them asking God questions, we see people growing because of it. In fact, in, in Jesus' time on earth, Jesus received 80 questions, tough questions, questions of who is my neighbor, right? What, questions like, uh, what does love look like, right? We, we, we see Jesus answer questions. In fact, Jesus answers more questions than he does healings or does miracles and done signs and wonders. And check this out. Jesus loves questions. Ask, G- ask God the tough questions. Ask God, are you here? Ask God, why do you let this stuff happen? Why do you let this stuff happen? Because here's what I truly believe. I truly believe this as I research the Bible, as I go through life, as as God speaks to me. I really believe that there is nothing wrong with being honest with God. There's nothing wrong with being honest with God. There's nothing wrong with sharing God your real emotions. In other words, there's nothing wrong with being real with God. There's nothing wrong with telling God that you're frustrated with all the evil and the injustice and all the things that you see around the world. I, I, I uh, I think this hurts a lot because it's right in our backyard. This hurts a lot because it's so close to home. But there's nothing wrong with saying, God, I'm mad about this. God, I'm angry about this. I don't understand the evil that that is happening here, and I feel like you're doing nothing about it. You're just letting it happen, right? There's not, and it's and it's not just it's right now. It's Charlottesville. God, I don't understand why that is happening, right? I don't understand why innocent people have to die because someone chooses to do an evil act. God, I don't understand that. And it's okay to share that emotion with him. He can handle it. In fact, he's he's all-knowing, so he probably knows you already have these emotions anyways. All throughout the Bible, we see people be real with God. I mean, we see a guy by the name of David, right? And David, God, God says he was a man after God's own heart, but at the same time, this guy David was full of mistakes. This guy David was a guy who committed adultery, He was a guy that lusted after the girl he committed adultery with. He was a guy that murdered someone. He was a guy that lied and was deceitful. And at the same time, we see in the Bible, in Psalms 51, David's honest reaction as he prays to God. He says this, generous in love, God, give grace. Huge in mercy, wipe out my bad record. Scrub away my guilt. Soak out my sins in your laundry. It's real. He's just being real. He's just sharing his real emotions, and that's totally okay. Ask God the tough questions. Be real with him. The second, the second um, response that, that we are to have is be teachable. Be teachable. In the midst of, in the midst of this hate, in the midst of Habakkuk, asking the tough questions, in the midst of Habakkuk being confused and asking God why, in all that going around, Habakkuk still listened to God. Habakkuk still listened to God. See, it's easy when we're so passionate about something. It's easy when we're so frustrated about something. It's easy when we're so angry about something to totally ignore the wise counsel around us. And, as, and we're venting and we're frustrated and it's okay and we're doing all this and we don't hear any wise counsel around. It's easy to do that, but Habakkuk does something different. Habakkuk doesn't let his anger keep him from listening to wise wisdom that comes from the Lord. In the midst of his anger, he doesn't let his anger keep him from listening to wise, godly counsel. 
See, it's okay to be angry about evil things like I've already shared with you. It's okay to be frustrated, but don't let that frustration, don't let that anger drown out the wise counsel that God wants to give to you, maybe even through the people that love you dearly. A, the proverb, a proverb says this, that get all advice and instruction you can so you will be wise the rest of your life. See, the reality is this, that God wants to use your life in the middle of the chaos in this world. God wants to use your life in the middle of the chaos in this world. But in order for that to happen, you have to be teachable. You have to be able to listen to instruction. You have to be able to listen to godly counsel. You have to be able to listen to the Lord. Because he wants to take what seems so dark right now, what seems like there's no light in the end of the tunnel. He wants to make this moment, and he wants to one day use this moment to help others. A wise man once said that a night, the night comes before the dawn, but there is a dawn coming. There is a dawn coming. And in the middle of the craziness, in the middle of, the, uh, of what is going on in this world, God wants to use your life to bring light to it. The Bible says this, that he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Ask God the tough questions. Be teachable. Thirdly, thirdly, hold to what is true. Hold to what is true. What I love about Habakkuk's story is he, he is this guy that sees all these acts of justice around him. He's this guy that sees all this injustice circling around him. In this world, in the city that he's in, he sees that. He's angry about it. He's frustrated about it. He knows the person he's to go to, and that's the Lord. And he shares the, to the Lord this frustration, this anger, but at the same time, at the same time, after all that is said and done, he holds on to what is true. And he ends up worshiping and praying God. He holds on to what he's always been taught and what he knows is true and what he knows about God and what he knows about Jesus. And he holds on to that. And he says, even though it's crazy right now, even though it's chaotic right now, even though I'm angry right now, even all that is going on, God is still with me today. God's love is still here with me today. God is still faithful. See, here's the truth. God is still the same yesterday as he is today as he will be tomorrow. And Habakkuk understands that. Habakkuk actually starts worshiping. In fact, in Habakkuk 3, it says this, fig trees may no longer bloom. Vineyards produce grapes. Olive trees may be fruitless. And harvest time a failure. Sheep pens must be empty and cattle stalls vacant. But I will celebrate because the Lord God saves me. The Lord God gives me strength. He makes me feet as sure as those of a deer and helps me stand on the mounts. In the middle of all this craziness, if you notice, he, he, he takes this comparison. He, he takes this moment and he says, all this is empty. There's no, there's no harvest. There's no cattle. All this stuff is, it seems like it's all failing around me. But God still reigns. The God, the same God that was with the Israelite people way back when is the same God that's with me today and will be with me forever. In fact, in Psalms, it says this, For the Lord is good, his unfailing love continues forever, and his, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. I know it seems bad right now. I know it's hard. I know for a lot of us, our heart is hurting. I, I get it. My heart is hurting too. 
But the same God that loved us a week ago, that, loved, that knew the hairs of our head, how many hairs are on top of our head, that same God that knows that, that same God that showed us love, that same God that demonstrated the greatest love, by while yet we are still sinners, he let his own son die for us. That same God, that same love is still here today, even when it doesn't feel like it. That same God will still, will, still will be with us tomorrow and in the future. That same love, that same faithfulness will still be there. You see, even though you may have questions, don't allow your questions to push you away from God's truth. Even though you may be confused, don't allow your confusion to push you away from what is true. And that God's love is still here. God still loves us. God still loves each and every person. Don't let your questions push you away from that. See, in James, it, it says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, but he, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Don't allow your questions to push you away from what is true. Hold on to what is true. And lastly, our last response is don't be bitter. Don't be bitter. It's easy when you see all the terrible things that are done around you to just give up on the give up on people to give up on life to give up on everything around you but instead of giving up on people instead of being bitter to people instead of responding to this ridiculous hate with hate let's respond to this ridiculous hate with a radical love See, what, where do we go from here? What is our response? Our response is to choose to radically love God and love people in the, mi in the midst of all this ridiculous hate. The Bible says that, that to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says to love your enemies, to pray for those who persecute you. The Bible is all about love. It, it, it talks about in Mark 12, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And even though we have experienced and heard about all this hate in the world, it does not deny the fact that we are still meant to love. We're still meant to love the people that may even hate us, that may even hate the, uh, this world. We are to love them. And how we respond to ridiculous hate is we choose to love. And that love seems crazy. Like, how do you love a person that shoots all these innocent people? How do you do that? You ask God for strength. You pray for those people every day. You pray for the victims of, uh, in Las Vegas every day. Every chance you get, you pray for them. You show God's love. You may not never even meet these people, but you radically love them by praying for them and caring for them. See, how we respond today will be told about tomorrow. Christian, if you want to Come up and play a little bit. How we respond today will be told about tomorrow. And how we respond today is we choose to radically love. I'm going to take a moment and pray with us, and, and pray for all of us, myself included. Pray for the victims. And after I pray, after I say amen, I want to encourage you. Let's choose to radically love. And let's start by spending some time in prayer and worship. And so I'm going to invite you after I pray to, to come on forward. But only come if you truly mean it. Only come if, if, you're, if you're willing to radically love. I would much rather you be real in this moment, not only with yourself, not only with those around you, but with God. 
than to just do it because all your friends are doing it. So let's choose a radically love. That is our response. That is what we were called to do. That is what we were meant to do in the craziness and the chaos and in everything that's going on in the midst of all this ridiculous hate that is happening around us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your love is still here with us today. We thank you that in the middle of this chaos, in the middle of this ridiculous hate, in the middle of all the craziness that's going on, that your light will still be made known and that your light is in all of us. And so, God, I ask for each one of us that you would give us the strength to choose to radically love you and to radically love those around us. People around us may think it's crazy. People around us may think, how can you love the people that How can you choose to love people and pray for people that that could be the result of all this happening? And we do it because you help us. You give us strength when we are weak. And God, we ask for that strength in these moments. We ask that you help us not to be bitter. You help us not to be bitter to those around us. You help us not to give up on people, but choose to love people and choose to love you in the middle of all this confusion, in the middle of all these questions. We love you, Lord. In your precious name, amen.